welcome to the Alexandria Center for Hellenistic Studies and Institute for Mediterranean Studies uh, Neoplatonic Lectures. It is our great pleasure today to have with us uh, Professor Jan Sommer. Everybody knows who Jan Sommer is. Uh, he is a research professor of philosophy uh, at the KU11 in Belgium. Uh, prior uh, to this, he has also been professor at the University of South Carolina uh, in the US and at the University of Cologne. Uh, he's invited or uh, visiting professorships include uh, the uh, Ecole Pratique, the Hautes Etudes in Paris and the University of Lausanne. Uh, while he has also been uh, a research fellow uh, at, uh, in, in Berlin uh, and in King's College London and in the Institute of uh, Classical Studies in London as well. And as uh, we are between Athens and Alexandria, let me also add that he is a doctor honoris causa of the National and Cappadocian University of Athens. Um, uh, Jan Sommer is the author of many books and articles on uh, ancient Platonism. And by saying many, uh, we mean more than 100 peer-reviewed book chapters, almost 35 uh, papers, six edited volumes, and four books, uh, among which uh, In Search of the Truth, Academic Tendencies in Middle Platonism by the Royal Academy of Belgium in 1998, as well as uh, two commentaries, uh, stemming from the ancient commentators on Aristotle project, both co-authored with Professor Carlos Steele, namely Proclus on the existence of evils in, in 2003 and Proclus 10 problems against pro uh, concerning providence in 2012. Um, Jan Sommer is, among others, a specialist of uh, Iamblichus, and uh, he has contributed the survey article on Iamblichus to the new uh, Uberwerk, which is, of course, a monumental uh, work uh, on ancient philosophy in 2018. Last but not least, uh, he is the holder of an advanced grant of the European Research Council, uh, under the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, his project, uh, Plato or via Aristotle, studies the contribution of Aristotle's criticism to, uh, of Plato's views to the formation of uh, the Platonic tradition. Um, so, uh, Jan Sommer may be uh, a research professor, but uh, as I have had the honor uh, to work under his direction in Leuven for more than three years, I would also like to add that he is uh, a devoted and gifted teacher. Jan, uh, thank you very much for having accepted this invitation. And uh, we are eager to learn more about your topic today, uh, Epistemic Authority and Traditions of Wisdom, Iamblichus on Non-Hellenic Myths. Thank you very much, um, Irini, for this very kind introduction. Let me first start sharing my screen. Um, I hope that everyone also has received the same text as a handout. Um, but I will now. Um, can you confirm that everyone is seeing it? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So then we can go ahead. The figure of the pagan holy man has been roaming scholarship of late antiquity for quite some time now. Yet scholars remain suspiciously silent when it comes to defining this figure 
unless one considers definitions by example um, to be satisfactory. Examples are often Pythagoreans or are labeled thus by scholars. The main reason being that Pythagoras was considered by them a paradigmatic wise uh, man whose life and precepts all, maybe all later Greek sages imitated. Apollonius of Tiana comes to mind, but also some Platonist philosophers, among whom Iamblichus of Chalcis figures prominently. Um, um, other philosophers who may qualify for the title are Plotinus, in whose tradition Iamblichus wants to place himself, and Proclus, who can be regarded as a late follower of Iamblichus. What these men have in common is that each of them is the subject of a biography that could be called and has been called with some exaggeration, a hagiography. These biographies indeed have many features in common with the Christian hagiographies um, of the period. Not only are these men described as extraordinarily knowledgeable um, and wise, as extremely virtuous and in particular also pious, but also with what looks to be superhuman abilities. For instance, the ability to perform what one cannot but call miracles. These pagan people have something saintly about them, or rather, since I want to avoid the all too Christian connotations of that word, something holy. It is indeed clear that the lives of these people situate themselves in the sphere of religion and that what makes them special was connected by their contemporaries with phenomena and entities that are superhuman. They are indeed said to have had communion with gods, demons, and such like. This brings us back to the problem of defining the holy person. We should not expect to be able to define them with great precision, since it is an accepted rule of thumb for definitions that they should have the same degree of precision and vagueness as their definiendum. And since the phenomenon itself has no sharp borders, a sharp definition will be neither possible nor desirable. Because of the limitations of my own competence, I shall leave much of what there is to say about a pagan holy man or people to historians, sociologists and historians of religion, restricting myself to a phenomenon that has attracted the attention of philosophers and overlaps with this issue, that of epistemic authority. I shall moreover apply a further restriction by focusing on Iamblichus and within Iamblichus on a specific domain and group of figures clad with authority. Um, before I go ahead, I will quickly explain a model for mapping of, um, uh, this issue of epistemic authority um, that we will use for heuristic purposes. Um, so if you see the handout, uh, Epistemic authority is usually distinguished from uh, executive authority and the authority to uh, impose uh, certain uh, normative um, uh, desires or, or uh, expectations on other people, be it political or, or religious or whatever. Um, and in order, to, this model only serves the purpose of being able to distinguish certain factors and compare different phenomena. phenomena. So we assume in Leuven we had a project on this and we, we developed this uh, document, this uh, model. We assume that an authority relation is a relation that results from an act of attribution or a series of act, acts of attribution. And then you can distinguish several factors and we will try to distinguish them at the end to see what, what are the results of what we have discussed. So there is the attributor, you have to define who is the attributor of a certain epistemic quality, and that can go from a prima facie um, authority, you're willing to believe it, but will still be checking whether what, you, um, what, what you've learned is true or not, or whether you will accept it or not, up to complete infallibility. So um, a kind of authority that would defeat any other claims, uh, uh, like conflicting claims about the same issue. The bearer of authority can be persons, but could also be texts, uh, more generally signs. For instance, a traffic sign is a bearer of epistemic authority. Uh, you have to distinguish, uh, to, to specify which is the domain and on the basis of which grounds 
um, authority has been um, or is being attributed. No? So, and as I said, we use this um, mainly for heuristic purposes, as you will see. Um, authority becomes a social reality by the fact that it is communicated and accepted or not accepted. People have a certain competence for attributing it, but also for recognizing these uh, acts of, or, or these attributions of authority. And you don't need a concept of authority to be able to do that. Just like you don't need a concept of irony to be able to recognize ironic statements or to utter ironic statements. Um, so it's an inherently uh, normative phenomenon, but as historians, uh, or as an historian, I look at it uh, in a descriptive, uh, from a descriptive point of view. Okay, that much for the model. Let's now go to the, to Jamblikus. And I start with the word, the work that was called De Mysterius Aegyptiorum or the reply to Porphyry as its more appropriate title, I think. This work takes the form of a long epistle addressed by Jamblichus to his senior colleague Porphyry. Uh, thanks to the work done by Per Safre, we are now able to understand much better the structure and the argumentative strategies of this difficult, not to say obscure text. Starting from the traditional but incorrect title, one could be forgiven to think that in this text, Jamblichus provides us with a long account of the religion, mythology, or theology of the Egyptians. However, that is not the case for several reasons. First, it is not Jamblichus himself who speaks, strictly speaking. Secondly, Jamblichus does not directly address a general if even classically schooled readership. And thirdly, the text does not deal primarily with Egyptian realities. In order better to situate uh, this text, it is necessary to look at how it is framed and contextualized, what is its literary genre and its origin. What I will be saying about this is nothing new. It basically um, is the fruit of the uh, Safre's uh, labors. Jamlikus's letter probably dates from the years 300-305 uh, and is a reply to a letter written by Porphyry. His letter was addressed to a certain Anibo, an Egyptian priest. It was known to several Christian authors and was still around in the late Middle Ages. Anibo, as far as we can tell, was a fictional character whose name probably means great is his master which could very well be an allusion to Hermes Trismegistos, three times the greatest. This provides the link with Iamblichus, the real life addressee of the letter, and also with the Egyptian wisdom tradition called Hermetism, effectively a blend of original Egyptian traditions and Hellenic thought. By the way in which he replies, Iamblichus makes clear that he has very well understood the various hints and steps. He replies by authoring what is in effect an open letter, adopting the mask of an Egyptian priest, more precisely that of a prophetes, which is the highest priestly class preceded by the grand priest alone. Iamblichus adopts the persona of um, this fictional priest of superior rank and chooses as his pseudonym, Abamon. By adopting this identity, the author lays claim to an authority that surpasses that of Anibo. He moreover presents himself as a successor to the divine scribes, that is the hierogrammates, who are priests and exegetes and are supposed to have instructed the ancient Greeks in matters of wisdom. It does not really matter, writes the author of the letter, whether Porphyry considers the first person, I, of the author as the true author of the words contained in the letter or as some other priest. By saying that the pseudonymous author exploits and continues the game of identities between the presumed addressee of Porphyry's letter, Anibo, on the one hand, and Abamon on the other, but above all, he plays on the identity of the real author of the reply, Iamblichus himself, that is. All of this is in text one, which I will not read now, but I will come back to it uh, later. 
It is important to keep in mind that it is not Iamblichus who is responsible for the Egyptian fiction, as it is called by Persafre, but rather Porphyry, who has pretended to address a letter to an Egyptian priest, who in reality does not exist. In a spirit of one-upmanship, Iamblichus has degraded Anibo's status to that of a disciple. By Coining the pseudonym Abamon, which means belonging to Amon, he signals that he is the hierarchical superior of his opponent. And moreover, he suggests that he possesses theurgic virtues. At the very beginning of the text, Iamblichus invokes Hermes. You see in text one, it's the first word, huh? Hermes, the god who presides, and so on, whom he calls the god and patron of rational discourse first line on your text one of the handout. So Theos, Hoton, Logon, Hegemon, Hermes. This expression corresponds to the epithet master of divine words belonging to thought, the equivalent of the Greek Hermes. This literary framing is thus meant to signal in an unambiguous matter to Porphyry as well to any informed readership that Iamblichus's own authority in matters pertaining to religion and Egyptian mythology is well above that of Porphyry. But also above the authority Porphyry had already implicitly attributed to Iamblichus. There is another side to this coin. Because of the literary framing, any statements the author is about to make in the rest of the text is meant to be understood within the literary fiction, that is, as an account given by an Egyptian prophet. Hence, we cannot straightforwardly assume that what we, what, what we read is what Jamblichus would have said if he had been speaking in propria persona. This is important in the light of the doctrinal content, which is not always easy to square with Iamblichus' uh, platonic system, or at least the correspondences are not always immediately obvious. However, that is a matter that need not concern us here. Now, given the initial framing of the work, one would expect that the Egyptian fiction is maintained throughout the text until its end. But although the letter is indeed bookended by an explicit mention of his addressee, it is not the case that this context is present throughout. The letter rather contains three parts. The first deals with the classification of superhuman, that is semi-divine and divine entities. The second with divination. The third with theurgy. It's only in this third theurgical part that the intra-diegetical author, so the author in the story, Abamon, honors his, his uh, pseudonym and deals explicitly with Egyptian theology. So we have to wait until that part. In that part, he also discusses elements of the Assyrian tradition. I follow Hans Louis in assuming that the term Assyrian refers to Chaldean wisdom understood in a broad sense. Uh, Polymnia Athanasiadi thinks there is an ad in addition, a specific case or family in Apamea uh, called uh, the Chaldeans, but that's uh, yeah, a, a hypothesis. I'm not really competent to, to deal with that. Scholars appeal to the concept of authority in order to explain the use made of religious myth by both participants in the controversy. So I'm not inventing this authority, let's say focus, it is already part of uh, scholarship. Um, Persafre thinks that the appeal to the authority of Egyptian wisdom allowed Porphyry to present his doubts and aporiae in a modest form, whereas Iamblichus could profit from the role assumed by him in order to claim the most ancient provenance possible for his theological views. Both the Egyptian wisdom and the Assyrian Chaldean tradition were held to stem from divine revelations which for any readership would completely justify their authority, 
given the veracity of the gods. However, these two sources of ancient wisdom were not held to be of equal value. There is a difference. Even though the Egyptian tradition was held to be the most ancient and the purest source of religious doctrines and practices, the highest attainable knowledge in matters divine was thought to be contained in the Chaldean oracles, probably because they were held to be oracles. Safre thinks that Yamlukas implicitly recognizes the superiority of the Chaldean tradition, and we will see some evidence for that later on. Let us now examine from up close the epistemic authority attributed to the religious myths by Abamon and by the author hiding behind that mask. A number of questions need to be resolved. How can we ascertain the different types of authority of these different traditions? What arguments does Yamlikus provide to justify this difference? How is it possible that if both are the result of revelation, one of them is superior. A further question has to do with um, Yamlikus presumed access to these um, traditions of wisdom. So how does Yamlikus know? This question pertains not only to the different sources at their disposal, but also to the lack of intelligibility characteristic of these texts and practices. The latter aspect highlights the importance of the exegete. Because it's, difficult, because it's unintelligible, you need a good exegete. And explains also the hierarchy of the different classes of priests and exegetes, and ultimately also that the hierarchy between Porphyry and Yamlukas. In order to find an answer to these questions, I propose to take a quick look at the introduction to the letter, as well as to some passages from the third part of the work in which Yamlukas focuses on what he calls the barbarian traditions. But before we do that, um, I suppose we first take a look at another text, the Pythagorean life. So we will come back to text uh, one uh, later. And um, I'm glad to see uh, two of the, or one of the translators, uh, Professor Dylan, uh, present here today. Um, thank you, John, for attending. As always, I've profited a lot from your translations. But first, let's look at the Pythagorean life, again translated, among others, by, by among others, uh, John Dylan. Uh, while it is true that this text uh, heavily depends on all kinds of sources, and that there is a whole scholarly industry of comparisons between the lives of Pythagoras by various authors, and that there are moreover uh, parallels with the Corpus Hermeticum, I will disregard this aspect completely and look at the work as a single text authored by Iamblichus. So it's a methodological choice. For whatever material he cobbled together, it is he who published it as his work. As you will see, the information the text provides about non-Greek religious and mythological uh, traditions indeed provides a more or less unitary vision. Yamlikus has taken over traditional material, has added comments and put his own mark on them. But first I need to say something about the book and again, I'm. Uh, I have to uh, acknowledge my debt to Professor Dillon, who first uh, made a, a great study of the context of this work. The book on the Pythagorean life uh, forms the beginning of a large compendium of Pythagorean texts called either Perites Pythagoriques Hairesios, the title in the Pinax of the Laurentianus uh, 86 3 manuscript or Synagoge ton Pythagoreon dogmaton, a title that we find in uh, Syrianus. This great work consisted of 10 books of which only a part has been preserved. In general idea is pretty clear. It is an introduction to philosophy through a corpus of Pythagorean texts for Yamlikus's version of Platonism is essentially that of a 
Pythagorean Platonism, since he holds that Plato's philosophy is itself held to be the heir of an older Pythagorean tradition. Iamblichus's construal of the tradition certainly constitutes a simplification, and in some sense, a distortion of the historical truth. Since the Pythagoreanism that inspired the Platonic philosophy of the early empire, on which Iamblichus drew, was itself drenched in Platonic and Aristotelian teachings, and is definitely not identical with the original ancient philosophy of Pythagoras and his immediate followers. It is moreover an undeniable fact that Plato was himself already inspired by certain Pythagorean ideas, notably for his idea that the world is structured in accordance with numerical proportions and geometric figures. But it were Platonists from the post-Hellenistic time, that is philosophers whose worldview was predominantly colored by Plato's Pythagorean dialogue, the Timaeus, who undertook the Pythagorean reinterpretation of Plato's major dialogues using conceptual tools such as Aristotle's hylomorphism that were developed only later, but were then injected back into what they considered to be originally Pythagorean doctrines. And again, this is a simplification, but it's at least uh, roughly correct, I think. In so doing, this tradition turned uh, back on itself, claiming an ancient heritage for ideas that were developed much later. The construal of one's own school history was thus key to their own self-understanding, uh, but also resulted in a series of simplifications. It was Iamblichus who inaugurated the final phase of ancient Platonism by looking to pre-Platinian models in order to reintegr reintegrate the Pythagorean tradition with Platonism. So that's the context. This context explains what is at stake for Iamblichus's Pythagorean project and for the biography of Pythagoras with which it starts. This work is aptly called the Pythagorean life, not the life of Pythagoras. This is a meaningful detail as Iamblichus clearly intends the life of Pythagoras to be a paradigm for aspiring young philosophers, even if there's little hope that they could ever attain the more than human perfection of the master. This also means that Pythagoras's attitude towards various religious tra traditions is emblematic. Hence, Iamblichus's account of Pythagoras in this respect is not just des descriptive, but comprises a strongly normative component. This is moreover confirmed by the second part of the Pythagorean Companion, that is the work whose title alone indicates it normative, its normative nature. It's called Protrepticus, so the second book. Well, let's go back to the life of the Pythagorean life. Text two, it's the beginning of the work uh, where he starts with an invocation of divine aid. I read, at the start of every philosophical investigation, it is after all the custom, at least for all those who are sound minded to invoke God. But at the outset of that philosophy, rightly believed to be named after the divine Pythagoras, it is surely all the more fitting to do this. For since his philosophy was at first handed down by the gods, ecteon garautes paradoteses, it cannot be comprehended without the gods' aid. So this says something about how, to, how we can understand that we need divine aid. Moreover, its nobility and greatness exceed human ability to understand it immediately. Only when the goodwill of the gods leads the way can someone with gradual approach slowly appropriate something from it. From the start of the work, Iamblichus thus emphasizes the idea that Pythagorean philosophy has been taught to us humans, more precisely to Pythagoras and to the Pythagoreans by the gods. Moreover, whoever wants to understand these doctrines will again need divine assistance for the beauty of these teachings surpassed by far our human capacity, so that it can only be grasped through the help of gods with, who in their benevolence teach it to us progressively. Then Iamblichus discusses some of the difficulties um, that threaten this project. Text number three. For all re these reasons then, invoking the gods as leaders, 
and entrusting ourselves and our discourse to them, let us follow wherever they lead, in no way discouraged by the long time this philosophical school has been neglected, concealed by our outlandish teachings and secret codes, aporetos symbolos, obscured by numerous false and spurious treatises, and entangled in many other similar difficulties. For us, the will of the gods is sufficient with which we can endure even more difficult circumstances than these. And after the gods, we shall choose as our leader, the founder and father of this divine philosophy. So as Luc Brisson and Alain Segond have pointed out, it is not correct to state that the Pythagorean school of thought waned at the beginning of, the, of our era, even though this sentiment had become part of the Pythagorean tradition. The idea of sinking and oblivion points to the more general problem linked to the longevity of the tradition, which entails an ever, dis, uh, ever increasing distance to its roots, as well as to as the danger of lacunae. The other two problems uh, named by Yamlikus are equally interesting and also occur in the reply to Porphyry, so in the Mysterious. Yamlikus recognizes the existence of apocryphical texts which pose a threat to the contamination, uh, but, uh, a threat of contamination of the tradition. Now it's somewhat ironic, but Yamlikus himself is responsible for including in the Pythagorean tradition um, several texts which modern scholars have shown to be apocryphical. Obviously, these are not the texts he means here. So besides the texts that we possess, uh, and that we regard as pseudepigraphic, there must have been others uh, which possibly uh, were so clumsily composed that they could not fool him. At any rate, uh, his remark shows that he is aware of a possible problem of doctrinal transmission. The other problem he recognizes is that of the obscurity of the language and the doctrines. These one cannot understand except by interpreting them as symbols, tokens, veiling certain truths, that is as signs or statements that lend themselves to be understood at at least two levels, resulting in a distinction between surface meaning and hidden meaning. Further down in the text, Yamlikus will claim that the founders of the barbarian religions or even the gods granting the revelations have purposefully resorted to a symbolic language in order to hide certain mythical truths. The reason for doing so, he claims, was to protect them from ridicule and misunderstanding. Yamlikus believes that the truth behind the myths can nevertheless be understood and restored more or less adequately by select interpreters who possess certain intellectual virtues and moreover benefit from assistance given by superior powers, such as gods, angels, heroes, or demons. The two types of questions that we have distinguished earlier turn out to be closely linked in the text. On the one hand, um, the authority of Pythagorean philosophy warranted by its revealed character. And on the other hand, the authority of our sources compromised by problems of transmission and uh, lack of intelligibility. The second cluster of problems can only be tackled with divine help assisted by the divine Pythagoras himself. Now let's turn to this figure Pythagoras. Yamalekus stresses not only uh, his natural excellences, his nature that is somehow more than just human, but also his outstanding education and studies. And in text four, it says uh, that Talus urged Pythagoras to go to Egypt uh, where he could learn things. But Pythagoras, first set sail to Sidon because he learned that that was his native land. That's text five. So I will not read everything, of course. Huh? Um, and maybe 
read five anyway. So there he joined the descendants of Mochus, the prophet and natural philosopher and other Phoenician hi hierophants and was initiated into all sacred rites of the mystery celebrated especially in Byblos and entire and in many parts of Syria uh, and so on. Interestingly, Jamblichus mentions the derivative character of Phoenician read, uh, rites, um, as you see at the end of the citation, they were somehow derived and descended from the sacred uh, rites in Egypt. This means they are also inferior. That may be very well be a stab at Porphyry, who was himself Phoenician. Be that as it may, Iamblichus continue, continues the narration and tells us that upon his arrival in Egypt, so now we go from uh, Phoenicia to Egypt, Pythagoras begins his visits of the local temples and consults priests and prophets eager for instruction. He wants to learn. He is active in looking for knowledge, metaplestes pudes kai acribus excitasios, and consults priests who are specialized in different fields in order to gather, gather a comprehensive knowledge of religious matters. Uh, so religious matters are mentioned explicitly. Pythagoras spent 22 years studying three domains especially, astronomy, geometry, and through initiation, the mysteries of the gods. Later, he was taken a prisoner and taken to Babylon, where he continued his studies at the feet of the Magi. This time he concentrates on different topics, arithmetics, music, the other mathematical sciences, and the cult of the gods. The sciences, sciences he acquires in Babylon are lauded in even more exalted terms as those of Egypt. And then we are at text six. And this I think uh, is already a confirmation of the higher status the Chaldean uh, oracles have. So you see the language becomes different. He thoroughly studied perfect worship of the gods with them and reached the highest point huh, in knowledge of numbers, music and other mathematical sciences. Um, ep Akron. Huh? Um, this surplus of excellence is certainly due to his uh, advanced age and uh, experience, but is probably meant to reflect an intrinsic superiority also of the Babylonian tradition. After that, he returns to Samos, where he starts teaching rendering his teachings in a symbolic form as the Egyptians has shown, uh, uh, shown him, text seven. So he tried to present his symbolic manner of instruction entirely like the teachings which he learned in ancient Egypt, in, in Egypt, sorry. However, his didactic method was not a great success with the Samians. Huh? Yamlikus remark, may have to do with the hieroglyphs that seem to condensate a complex object of knowledge in a single sign, but it's also related to the narration of myths, prohibitions and moral precepts, ritual objects, attributes used in all kinds of religious practices. Then um, Iamblichus uh, gives further uh, corroboration of Pythagoras's uh, epistemic credentials when he points out that he was also initiated in the mysteries of Orpheus. In Orphism, we even find the model for his arithmetic theology, he claims, after a rather abrupt transition in the narration. Pythagoras is even said to be the author of a theological text called the Sacred Discourse, which Iamblichus claims sprang from the most mystic part of the Orphic corpus. Our author does not pronounce himself very clearly on the vexed issue of the authorship, for some claimed that uh, not Pythagoras himself was the author, but rather his son, uh, Tilauges, on the basis of memoirs that Pythagoras bequeathed to his daughter, Damo. Yet Iamblichus quotes the beginning in the work uh, uh, of the work 
oh, sorry, Yamlikus quotes the beginning in the work uh, in which Pythagoras claims Orphic authority for his text on the gods. And that's text number eight. This discourse is what I, Pythagoras, learned on initiation in the Thracian Libetra from Aglaofamas the initiator, who communicated to me that Orpheus, son of Calliope, taught by his mother on Mount Pangaion, said, uh, the eternal being of number is the most provident principle of the whole heaven, earth, and of the intermediate nature. Moreover, it's a source of permanence for divine men and gods and demons. From this then, it is clear that he derived the idea of the essence of the gods as defined by number from the Orphics. I have quoted this text as an illustration of the care Yamlicus takes to underline the grounds of the authority of uh, Pythagoras. However, Yamlicus does not res restrict himself to this straightforward claim, but says that it is necessary to provide examples substantiating his claim. Another uh, one example he quotes is that of Abaris, who was taught the complete truth, uh, quote unquote, by Pythagoras. This truth was related to the divine science of numbers and made Abaris abandon the traditional practice of bird sacrifice in order to embrace the um, divine arithmetic. Pythagoras's Orphic initiation, moreover, gave, gave him power over wild animals comparable to that of Orpheus, Yamlicus says, which is again a sign of the fact that he was loved by the gods. The, now I will say a few words about the symbolic uh, mode of teaching. Text nine. A uh, mode of teaching held in high esteem by the Greeks because of its ancient provenance, and it was uh, practiced uh, eminently in Egypt. Now, Pythagoras formulates strict conditions for its use. Uh, we will uh, look at the text. Huh? Most indispensable for him was his manner of teaching by means of symbols. For this style of teaching was treated with respect by nearly all Hellenes, inasmuch as it was of ancient origin, and especially employed by the Egyptians in very subtle ways. Likewise, Pythagoras considered it of great importance if someone carefully and clearly elucidated the meanings and secret conceptions of the Pythagorean symbols and discerned how much rightness and truth they contained when revealed and freed from their enigmatic form and when adapted with simple and unadorned teaching for the lofty geniuses of these philosophers deified beyond human thought. Symbols are accordingly liable to decryption, at which point they stop looking ridiculous or trivial. Uh, this is said in text number 10. So the authority of symbols depends on their decryptability as well on the, possibly, uh, the possibility to verify afterward whether they really issue from profound uh, thought. This presupposes the possession of exegetical techniques and experience, as well as a profound knowledge of the realities to which they refer. Yamlikus is most definitely opposed to an attitude of blind trust towards symbols one does not understand. So the fact that he underlies the need for the for knowledge and for practice exegetical experience shows that he is critical of the use of symbols and uh, defines strict conditions for uh, uh, fruitful use of them. The doctrines of the Pythagoreans are not divulged to the many. They remain and are alluded to in enigmatic expressions that is by means of ambiguous or obscure language which has as its very aim to hide certain contents, contents from the non-initiated. Uh, he says that explicitly. Pythagoras's teaching enjoyed a very high epistemic authority with his disciples, who were even convinced that his teachings could not be false, which is why they called him divine. Uh, that's also something Iamblichus says uh, 
in chapter 148. What is also needed is um, our intellectual virtues. This is um, uh, discussed in chapter um, uh, 29 of paragraphs 157 to 166. This chapter precedes the account of the moral virtues. In praising his wisdom, Iamblichus attributes to uh, Pythagoras an unsurpassable epistemic authority. It is reflected in the memoirs, supomnemata, written up by Pythagoreans that contain, as he says, the truth about everything, peripanton echonta ten aletheia. Uh, you see that in uh, text 11. Huh? On the subject of his wisdom, let the greatest proof be the commentaries written by the Pythagoreans containing the truth of about all things. They are well-rounded in all other respects, encrusted with an old-fashioned and ancient style, exuding, as it were, a bloom not touched by hand, composed perfectly with heaven sent knowledge. They are full of most sagacious conceptions and especially varied and versatile in form and content, remarkably simple and at the same time not lacking style, and filled to the utmost with clear and indisputable realities accompanied by scientific and full demonstration, what is called deductive argument. Huh? Now you see the word syllogism at the end and ap apodexis, apodexis epistomenicae. Um, the memoirs, the hypomnemata, who are either supposed to be Pythagoras's own or composed by his disciples based on his teaching, deal with all kinds of subjects from physics, logic, ethics, mathematics, music, medicine to the mantic art divination, but with a special focus on intelligible and divine realities. Through wisdom, of which philosophy is the desire, desire for wisdom, uh, so true wisdom um, consists in the knowledge of incorporeal realities, devoid of matter, impassable and active, eternal and intelligible, those one calls kurios onta. Yeah? This is, of course, what Platonists call them. In all of these domains that I just listed, the hypomnemata enjoy an incomparable authority because, as Iamblichus intends to make us accept, they contain only truths. However, Iamblichus does not require us to accept this dogmatically because he constantly provides us reasons, such as the evidential character of what they state, as well as the logically rigorous form in which they are cast. In all these domains, Pythagoras has transmitted the appropriate scientific knowledge. These, that is um, a quote or quote from the translation. Implicitly, therefore, Iamblichus presents Pythagoras as the source of what Plato knew. Pythagoras's knowledge of mathematics stems from um, Egyptians, Phoenicians, and Chaldeans, yet he has advanced these sciences. So Py Pythagoras has advanced the science of mathematics and at the same time has taught them in an exemplary way suited to the level of understanding of his audience. So his wisdom and the acquisition of wisdom, uh, which has been described, was or were paired with supreme didactic qualities, which contributed to the fact that everyone could participate in the knowledge. Even though divinely inspired, Pythagoras's acquisition of knowledge required a hard and sustained intellectual effort on his behalf. The same is true for his disciples, which is one of Iamblichus's key messages. The disciples too need to study. They need to train their memory and sharpen their logical abilities. This is, by the way, confirmed by other passages, for instance, from the Protrapticus. Whereas in the 
Pythagorean life, the barbarian tribes were cited for their contribution to mathematics. In the reply to Porphyry, it is rather their knowledge of religion and theology that is at stake. So let's now turn back to that work and especially the introduction. Uh, so that's, I turn back to my first text on the handouts. As I already said, he starts by invoking Hermes who presides over rational discourse. He is the patron of all priests and the only God who presides over the true signs of all gods. That's lines three and four. Um, Jamblichus then says that our ancestors, and that's of course the ancient Egyptians uh, in this fiction, have attributed their own discoveries to Hermes, putting the name of Hermes on their works. Uh, um, lines, about line five, huh? uh, five and six, it's to him that our ancestors in particular dedicated the fruits of their wisdom, attributing all their own writings to Hermes. Huh? With this surprising claim, Abamo or Jamblichus alerts us to the fact that the Hermetic writings are the product of the ancient Egyptians and they contain their discoveries, even that all ancient writings are attributed to, to him. That's what he says. It would be jumping to the wrong conclusion um, if one were to infer that according to Jamblichus, this attribution is false because these works only contain human discoveries. He rather wants to emphasize the idea that the ancients wanted to honor the God for his genuine role in their discoveries, as Jamblichus himself does. This remark then in no way diminishes the authority of the Hermetic uh, treatises, but rather confirm it. The introduction defines the terms of the so-called uh, Egyptian fiction. It contains several keywords that are essential for the play on authorities. The authority that Jamblichus play acts vis-a-vis -vis Porphyry, but also the authority attributed to the myths by Porphyry and by Jamblichus. And it's the second type that interests us uh, especially here. The authority to which Jamblichus uh, lays claim for himself depends to a large extent on the fictitious state, uh, his fictitious status as priest prophet and his expertise in Egyptian religion that comes with this. Egyptian religion itself too enjoys a very high religious authority. We should distinguish two aspects. The presumed authority of the texts as reliable sources for the views of their authors but more importantly, the authority of the text as sources of philosophical truth, which depends to a large degree upon the authority accorded to the presumed ultimate authors of these texts. The author, so Abamon or Jamblichus, assumes personal authority by a formula of conditional modesty or false modesty. So that's about line uh, eight. Here, if we for our part, um, if we for our part receive from this God our due share of favor, such as we are capable of receiving, and then insofar as this condition is met, the author will be able to reach truth in his reply to the aporia uh, raised by Porphyry. Huh? Here, it is reasonable for me to grant you a true reply to your uh, inquiries. The reference to uh, Pythagoras, so next line, uh, Pythagoras, Plato, Democrates, uh, Eudoxus, and many others who have supposedly received a suitable uh, teaching from the sacred scribes of their time, huh? which is said here, huh? um, that is from the hero Grammates, whose successor Jamblichus uh, claims to be, confirms for the addressee of the letter the high epistemic authority of this Egyptian tradition. The author then asks, not without irony, it's, uh, it seems to me, to disregard the identity of the author and thus also his um, 
authority. So here you see that here. Huh? So, um, so in view of this, I am presenting myself to take up the discussion and you for your part, if you will imagine that the same person is now replying to you as he to whom you wrote, or if it seems better to you, posit that it is I who discourses with you in writing or any other prophet of the Egyptians for it makes no difference. Or better still then I think dismiss from your mind the speaker, whether he be better or worse and consider what is said whether it be true or false, rousing up your intellect to the task uh, with a will. So Porphyry should focus on the content of what is said rather than on the author. Now, whether this is ironic or not, at any rate, the author has emphasized the intrinsic value of the arguments and claims to be, uh, uh, the arguments and claims to be presented in the text, which are thus assumed to support any contribution of and any appeal to authority. Then he says uh, that the issues raised by Porphyry belong to divine sciences and various other sources, the wisdom of the Chaldeans, the signs of the Egyptian uh, prophets, Greek philosophy also, and the um, common notions of, the, uh, of humans. Let's now look at text 12, which continues from text one. So at the outset, perhaps we should identify the number and types of problems set before us. We should also examine from what theological perspective the questions are being raised and demonstrate what are the branches of knowledge according to which they are being pursued. Some questions then call for the clarification of issues which have been wrongly confused while others concern the reason why various things are the way they are and are thought of in such a way. Others again, draw one's attention in both directions at once since they contain an inherent contradiction. And it still others call for an exposition of our whole mystical system. This being the case, uh, this is what I just said, they are taken from many perspectives and from various branches of knowledge. Some in fact require us to address them on the basis of the traditions of the sages of Chaldea. Others will derive their solutions from the teachings of the prophets of Egypt and others again, which relate to the speculations of the philosophers need to be answered on that basis. So it's, uh, you could read that as um, telling Porphyry that he uh, has confused things by mixing all these things up, right? Yamukas is saying you should distinguish them very carefully. There are also some that deriving from other opinions not worthy of note, involve one in unseemly controversy while others are drawn for the common conceptions of man, so the koinai enoiai. Each of these problems then appear in complex aspects and are variously related to one another and for all these reasons demand a mode of exposition which will organize them suitably. So he promises to bring order in this. The heterogeneity of the sources entails the, the risk of disagreement between the information they contain. And this forms the basis of a great many uh, aporiae raised by uh, Anibo Porphyry. In order to solve these, it is necessary then to distinguish carefully between, between the different divine sciences, to resolve terminological ambiguities, and to look for the reasons behind the various assertions made in these texts. In some cases, it will be necessary to expound, expound the entire mystagogy, that is the entire religious system. Now the characterization of these sciences as divine and as a part of mystagogy reinforces their high epistemic status. Taken literally, they point to the revealed character of these teachings, which means that ultimately, ultimately, divine powers are the warrants of their veracity. Because of a possible discord between various traditions and also because of the ambiguity and obscurity of the bearers of these presumed truths, the need for an expert exegete becomes pressing. Um, 
he says, I, I quote the Greek, Hotende diapanta tauta logo tinos esti epidee tu kat au thunontos auta prosekontos. This remark makes the link between the epistemic status of the text and the exegesis explicit. Then uh, Jamblichus promises to explain to Porphyry, or Abamon promises to explain to Anibo, uh, the Chaldean texts and those of the Egyptians, indicating that the first of these two traditions, so the Chaldean tradition, is younger and consists of a limited number of texts, whereas the tradition to which he himself belongs, or supposedly belongs, the Egyptian one, is very ancient and contains many theological texts. Then he says that even questions coming up from the Greek philosophical tradition can be solved with the help of, Egyptian, uh, of the Egyptian tradition by consulting the ancient stelae of Hermes, which were also consulted by Plato and Pythagoras. Some problems may thus, may thus be solved by philosophical argument, that is by discursive and logical thought. Others or other questions can only be approached by an intellective effort that transcends discursive thinking, he says, and is even more in need of divine assistance more than the uh, syllogistic or, or uh, discursive approach. But as far as these issues, um, but as far as issues that can be known by rational thinking are concerned, uh, so it's a restriction, he promises to leave no proof aside. Uh, it will come to ten telean apodexin. In other words, a rational demonstration is necessary whenever it is possible or wherever it is possible. But above all, it is vital to keep the different approaches apart. Philosophical, theological, theological questions all need to be treated in a different manner. And within philosophy, a different treatment is necessary for the science of principles, for ethics, for physics, and for other subdomains. So this is a methodological remark that contains a fundamental criticism of Porphyry's alleged lack of sophistication. Even so, and we're nearing the end, Jamblichus maintains that philosophical issues too can benefit from explanations based on Egyptian religion. Maybe this has to do with the distinction that Jamblichus seems to make. I refer back to text one, but I will not read it now, but he makes a distinction between to Hermes, the master of generic priestly discourse on the one hand, and the patron of theology on the other. Now, this distinction between two Hermes derives from the duality between the Greek Hermes, the inventor of language, and the Egyptian Hermes, master in theology. In the Hermetic text uh, themselves, a distinction is often made between a first and a second Hermes, the first being identical with the god uh, Thoth, the author of the hieroglyphic text inscribed on the stele, and the second his grandchild, responsible for the translations of these texts into Greek. So that's in the Corpus Hermeticum. The existence of reliable translations is essential for ensuring the authority of Egyptian texts for Greek philosophers, which is not, of course, necessary for Abamon himself, so the presumed um, author, who's after all uh, supposed to be an Egyptian priest. Yamlikus emphasizes that the ancient Greek philosophers read and studied the Egyptian text under the guidance of Egyptian priests, so another element to confirm their reliability. Come to the last part before the conclusion, but it's a short part. Uh, so in the last part of the De Mysterius, the reply to Porphyry, Abamon deals with the non-Greek uh, traditions. He gives us more details about the uh, Egyptian text and men mentions a certain Bittis, an Egyptian priest who supposedly translated 
hieroglyphic text from Sais into Greek. Sais is the city where Solon is supposed to have met Egyptian priests and to have translated a part of their archives. The author of these doctrines, translated by Bittis, more in particular certain theological teaching, more precisely on demiurgy, is said to be Hermes. But it is the prophet Bittis who has explained to King Amon the hieroglyphic text that he found. Bittis then has not merely decrypted the hieroglyphs, but also translated them into Greek. Besides those translated, there were many more texts, Yamilke says. Porphy, however, knows only a few of them, those that fell into his hands by coincidence, entois syngramasi hois leges pirite tuchekenai. So he grabs the opportunity to belittle his colleague once more. Uh, Yamlikus mentions several sources. The most important ones were those that were attributed to Hermes and contain his uh, doctrines. They were partly expressed in philosophical language. And this is interesting. Uh, look at text 13. These documents which circulate under the name of Hermes contain hermetic doctrines, even if they often employ the terminology of the philosophers. E kaiteton philosophon glotei polakis kretai. For they were translated by, from the Egyptian tongue by men not unversed in philosophy. Huh? Other texts, such as those written by Chairimon, deal with cosmology and astrology. The Salma uh, Shinyaka, a lost Greek uh, astrological text, contains only a very sp small part of the hermetic teachings. Finally, there are astronomic texts that deal only with the very lowest causes uh, studied by the Egyptians, as he says. As to the more important texts dealing with the first principles, Abelman mentions 20,000 hermetic books, according to Seleucos, or 36,525 books, according to Manitho, as well as an indefinite number of books on more particular principles. The question of the sources used by Yamlikus and Porphyry is not directly relevant for our purpose. What is important though, is that Yamlikus behind the mask of Abamon emphasizes the following points. First, the authority of Egyptian and other texts due to their revealed character as bearers of truth in the domain, domains of theology, the theory of principles, theurgy, mathematics, astronomy, astrology, and ethics. Second, the reliability of the sources used by him and Greek philosophers due in part to the availability of competent translators and hermeneutes. And thirdly, his own authority as an expert in these traditions, as a competent exegete, and more particularly as a specialist of the wisdom revealed in this uh, text. Um, let me see. In um, the third part of his reply, he cites several theological and mythological traditions. In some cases, he points co out contrasts. For instance, when he says that contrary to the Chaldeans, the Egyptian use threats vis-a-vis -vis the superior powers. He gives an explanation. He says, well, they mix discourses addressed to the gods with discourses addressed to demons. Uh, Safre and Sagon point out that this confirms the superiority of the Chaldean tradition. But there is no real contradiction between the two. Many times, Yamlikus explains apparent contradictions by the different levels at which principles and causes are situated in the hierarchy and says that hermetic texts, in fact, not only deal with gods, but also with lower realities, such as demons or even physical cause, causes. He uh, repeats that the, 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 the issue is made more difficult because of the Egyptian use of symbolic language. Uh, the symbols are supposed um, to be images of hidden realities, and this is an imitation in imitation of the demiurgic gods who also like to hide just like nature, he says. Um, the use of images is appropriate to the domain um, and understandably the symbols require a corresponding attitude on behalf of the uh, exegete and 
his audience, as you see in text 14, which I will now skip. Then he sets out to explain the deeper meaning, the news uh, of the words used in the narration or prayers that were probably already cited by Porphyry in his letter, but uh, that we cannot uh, possibly identify. But I give you some ideas, some examples to get to have an idea. For instance, Yamlikus uh, explains the deeper meaning of lemon, or he has appeared issuing from them, or sitting on a lotus, or the one who travels by boat. This some symbolic language is held to express a teaching, uh, and he says, "Has symbolique uh, It shows its subject in an indirect way, endeknumenos. Sometimes they are called these symbols are called ineffable to be used only by theurgists. Um, and he he says he is going to. Uh, explain what they mean in order to protect them from criticism. There are also the, the question of the names. The barbarian names are superior to the common denominations. And he justifies this in text uh, 15. Why of meaningful names do we prefer the barbarian to our own? For this again, there is a mystical reason. Since the gods have shown that the entire dialect of the sacred people, such as the Assyrians and the Egyptians, is appropriate for religious uh, ceremonies, for this reason, we must understand that our communication with the God should be in an appropriate tongue, and so on. And then there are also nations that are called holy. Um, uh, uh, they have learned names directly from the gods and have mixed them with their own language. And we should honor those names in respect for these traditions. The more, in quotes, rationalistic Porphyry, as he is sometimes described by uh, modern scholars, uh, on the contrary, has suggested to get rid of these uh, barbarian words while retaining the meaning. Iamblichus retorts that this point of view would have been defensible if these words had been conventional. However, because of their iconic value, hence of their origin in the nature of things, it is impossible to translate them. You see that in text uh, 16, for the names do not exactly preserve the same meaning when they are translated. So you would uh, incur a great loss if you would try to do that. Uh, um, the usefulness of these barbarian words consists then uh, of a surplus of meaning correlative of their uh, untranslatability, their ritual power, their solemnity, concision, and university. So even words receive a high authority, which is grounded in their supposed revealed nature and iconicity. This makes that they convey information that could not be communicated in a different manner. Yamlikus praises the linguistic and religious conservatism of the Egyptians, which he opposes to the taste for innovation and transgression. The ritual power of the words derives from the idea that the gods take a special pleasure in being invoked in accordance with the holy laws of the Egyptians, as they were the first to have received the possibility of participation in the gods. We come to our conclusion, and I will briefly um, show you the conclusions on the, on the handout. Uh, to give you an idea of the kind of distinctions that you can make uh, using that heuristic model that I uh, talked about. So we can now distinguish attributors of authority. We, we have found several. You have the author, Iamblichus. We have, for instance, Abamon in the Demisterius. We have in the life of Pythagoras, Pythag Pythagoras, Porphyry, and others. Bearers of authority can be very uh, different. They could be texts or signs like these cult elements, the names, and so on. Here we have focused on non-Greek traditions and various persons, so there are many bearers of authority. The quality, so the quality of the, uh, the property attributed, so the epistemic um, authority uh, can be different. Huh? So usually the texts examined here are con considered to be expressions of truth and wisdom, with some reservation in case certain myths are more 
mere human products or even falsifications. The quality also varies depending on specific epistemic uh, domains. We have seen that Yamlegus, for instance, uh, claims that Pythagoras improved on the mathematical knowledge transmitted to him. Then there are different epistemic domains that we have seen. In principle, there are no limitations, huh? as we have seen in these texts. Um, Yamlikus attributes a high authority to Pythagoras in all domains, all epistemic domains, but singles out some, and the quality of his authority varies across domains. Then we have looked at uh, some grounds for uh, attribution of epistemic authority that could be direct de defined revelations. Uh, we've also seeing the notion uh, pop up, notions implanted by nature, so the koinai enoyai, but also a great stress on studies, uh, on the epistemic virtues of the bearer of authority, so the author of a text, for instance, when he's talked about the intelligence of Pythagoras, his discernment, his patience, his circumspection, and so on, but also initiations, uh, which give, gave him a privileged um, access. We have looked at some threats to the um, uh, uh, authority, namely transmission. So he has talked about texts that may have not been transmitted in the best possible way. Intelligibility, the problem of language, uh, the problem of the use of symbols and how to understand them and so on. So we can also talk about some other uh, aspects, aspect, but I will uh, skip point six and seven. And uh, I can always talk about them if you uh, wish later on. Um, I consider this to be more like a kind of test case to show uh, the kinds of things one can distinguish when talking about um, authority or epistemic authority more particularly uh, in the case of uh, two interesting texts by a great uh, platonic author. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, for the very learned talk and for shedding new light on Iamblichus and on the way on which, in which we can read authority into you know, platonic sources. Um, I imagine there are uh, many questions and uh, so please, if you have a question, uh, you can uh, use uh, the chat and say you have a question or raise hands. I hope I can see them. Uh, Professor Dylan. Uh, John, we don't hear you. Uh, please uh, turn your micro on, your microphone. Mm -hmm. There we are, are we there? And you, yes. I did it, yes. No, that, that was delightful. I mean, a most fascinating exposition of, of, of what's behind Yambricus's uh, uh, thought system, really. Um, what, what I wanted to, just by this is all to start a conversation, um, do I, Take it that what Iamblichus is, is, is saying in all this is that there are a limited number of divinely inspired uh, sages. Um, some Greek, I mean, Plato would be one, Pythagoras is certainly one, uh, but more Egyptian and Chaldean uh, who speak with the authority of the gods, but also speak in uh, an enigmatic way, in symbols, which you have to interpret, uh, like Apollo in Delphi. And that this is the way, uh, the way to go. And it, it just occurs to me that th th that idea is similar to the, the concept behind theurgy that the gods have sown symbols in the physical world and that 
I mean, it, it is a matter of expertise to, to, to work them out and to identify them. And the right plant and the right stone and the right, uh, if, you, if you line them up, you get a, uh, you know, a very satisfactory result, <clears throat> but also to interpret the wisdom of Pythagoras or the Egyptians or so on, you have to understand the symbols and you have to have a, a mechanism, I suppose, a, a, a means of interpreting. Um, would that be correct? Um, yes, I think that is correct. So I, one of the things I wanted to um, bring across is that, well, these texts, different texts by Yamlika, they have been written with a specific audience and a specific purpose in mind and they want to show us something about not just let's say philosophical or religious uh, truths but also how we uh, should deal with them and how we get to know them and then there are privileged persons and so a lot of what he is saying and of course he's not alone in that so other uh, uh, philosophers have similar views sometimes um, is that we should understand that these some limited number of people have um, a privilege of access but as you can see in the case of uh, uh, Pythagoras but also of the uh, alleged or presumed uh, Egyptian priest Amamon and the other priest Anibo the fictitious person that it comes with a, a, a number of um, Call of duties, you know, you, you have to study, you have to be not only be aware of the symbolic meaning of what has been transmitted, but you have to train yourself to be able to understand it. And so that's also a message I think he wants to put across to whoever is reading the texts. Huh? So he may have had people in mind. Uh, um, and I think not just Porphyry, that's why I said it's an open letter, uh, the, the so called demisteries. And then indeed, uh, then, then, you, you, then you have to start making distinctions also. Uh, so, uh, uh, not all these um, traditions and not all these <clears throat> approaches are on a par. Uh, some are more specialized in mathematics or others uh, uh, have a higher status when it comes like the Chaldeans, when it comes about uh, revealing the, the nature of the divine world. Uh, indeed, I think that that, that, that is what, what uh, what it uh, comes down to. And then theurgy is related to this, uh, absolutely. Huh? Um, hmm. th theurgy too is an approach, and then some of these texts function in a theurgic context, I would say. Huh? But see, theurgy too is something that uh, requires a certain um, know-how and, and knowledge, huh? uh, very much so. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Just as a footnote, I'm, I'm, I remain intrigued by the person, by the identity of Mochas, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Phoenician sage that Pythagoras dropped in on, because I, I persist in believing that he, he's a corruption of Moses, but he does take on a personality of his own in, in the tradition, so one can't be certain. Um, Moshe and Moche um, might have something in common. And that is possible. possible. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, the, um, I, I, by, by coincidence, I've, I've worked on uh, um, a, a, a pretty unknown figure, um, Ophelius Laetus, or Laetus. Um, who was a Phoenician and who was uh, is supposed to have translated Mocha. So in, in many cases where you, you uh, find Mocha uh, cited, and this goes uh, uh, yeah, up to Damascus. So even as late as Damascus, when Mocha is cited, it's often, he's often cited together with this uh, translator, interpreter, uh, Ophelius Laetus. So even if he is, um, if it is a kind of uh, uh, distortion of the, the the name Moses, I think it it always comes through the Phoenician tradition. 
Yeah. Because because of this this translation story that that has to do with it. Yes, I think so. <coughs> yes, he he certainly does become a, a character on his own. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Well, enough from me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Professor Altman. Please. Thank you for your talk, Jan. Uh, I was. Um, struck by the very modern hermeneutic approach you took at the beginning uh, to the text in terms of distinguishing the views of its author from, um, from its speaker. Uh, it seemed a modern sensibility and it, it put me in mind of, of Plato. And so I'd like to ask you a, about a thought experiment. Imagine that we didn't have Plato's Timaeus. We didn't have the actual text. All we had is all the things that have been written about it. Um, and then lo and behold, at a time when people had modern hermeneutic sensibilities, lo and behold, all of a sudden, the text of the Timaeus was discovered. And we discovered that a wide variety of passages that had been directly attributed to Plato were in fact, not to be found in the Timaeus, since Plato never says anything in the Timaeus in his own name. Um, I'm wondering if in a world like that, where a rediscovered Timaeus came across, don't you think that a modern sensibility approaching the Timaeus, as it were, from the first time, would be as skeptical about whether we can disinter the statements of Plato from the Timaeus just as much as a good hermeneutic modern critic has disinterred the meaning of De Mysterious from those of a Iamblichus? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not sure because it's, a, it's an enormous thought experiment that, that requires a lot of effort to, to really uh, make. Um, I'm not sure I'm in the right set of mind to, to think of all its uh, consequences right now. Let's start with, um, what you said about, let's say, the, the modern approach. Um, the, the What is important, I think, what, what um, for instance, when we talk about the, the Egyptian fiction in the, in the Demisteris and the letter to, to Anibal or to Porphyry, um, it is clear that there is this play uh, of names and, and authorities. It is indeed very uh, comparable to what you often find in the beginning of platonic dialogues, where also kind of characters are introduced. And, um, and nowadays often interpreters say, well, we cannot take uh, uh, anything, any character in the dialogues of Plato says as literally being Plato's view. Um, for the, as for the Timaeus, let's, let's wait with the, the thought experiment. But as, as we now see it, I would say that a certain things that Plato says in the Timaeus uh, should be understood and were meant to be understood as being uh, said in a Pythagoreanizing or in a Pythagoreanizing or a Pythagorean, sorry, mode. Uh, which is why he introduces the character, which is why he uh, also refers to ancient Egyptian wisdom at the beginning. Um, now, we have, of course, Aristotle, who, for instance, in the Anima, um, talks about the Timaeus and, 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 and says, well, this is Plato. Uh, so Aristotle just ascribes anything that, that, that he finds in the Timaeus to Plato. Uh, um, but of course, Aristotle's uh, own approach to the Timaeus or to Plato in general isn't the most, let's say, uh, charitable that you could uh, think of. Right? So we, we have uh, reasons to suspect that he many times doesn't really care what Plato himself would have said. He is more interested in the position that he's criticizing. Right? Uh, now, um, yeah. Imagine that we didn't have the Timaeus and we, we would have, of course, many references to views in the Timaeus in authors like, uh, yeah, Proclus. We, we would have to discount Proclus because he has written the commentary on the Timaeus. So we would have 
we have would have to discount all the authors that didn't write commentary that did write commentaries on Timaeus and look for people who uh, or 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 this this discount the word the the commentaries themselves and, and and imagine that they were not there to see what the the same authors would say in different works. It would be very um, yeah, you would probably get an, an attitude towards the statements in the Timaeus that would be more skeptical than what, what we're doing right now. I, I agree right. with that, yeah. It's, it's very hard for me now to think through the consequences. Uh, Irene, could I just briefly follow up on that and, and, and just say, Jan, lose the thought experiment, that's fine. Uh, that that the hermeneutic set in place by Aristotle's comments about Plato uh, generally and the Timaeus specifically seem to have had a huge impact on the way people read that dialogue that runs very counter to the way you are advocating, and I believe accurately, that we should read De Mysterious. Uh, and I'm very grateful to your answer for acknowledging that 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 that, that, that Plato says in the Timaeus hermeneutic is open to very, very serious questions, mm -hmm. um, but it endures. I, I was pleased by your reply, but you would admit, would you not, that the dominant position, I believe, is still that we can find Plato's views directly expressed, not in the Egyptian tale so much of the Critias, mm -hmm. but in the Timaeus. And it remains a very dominant and very misplaced hermeneutic certainty, it seems to me. Yes. So I, coming from, uh, let's say, I, I study mostly later Platonism, where the Timaeus has indeed also, I think, thanks uh, among others to Aristotle, has had this role. Of, of being the most authoritative uh, dialogue for Plato's thought. I'm thinking of Middle Platonism and, 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 and later Platonism. So it's very, so I'm already biased by having studied these texts so much, but for Plato himself, I would be hesitant. So um, for instance, if um, Timaeus is called the, the, uh, as, as the, has the mind of an astronomer, right? that says something about the status of what is being said there, especially if you know what Plato says in the Republic about the value of astronomy. Um, right. uh, if we leave aside the hyper astronomy that he's mentioning also there. Uh, so, but I, so I agree that, that a more, um, um, like more cautious approach would be, uh, would be needed, I think, yeah. Thank you so much, Jan. You're a gentleman and a scholar. I've always admired your work and never more so than this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're too kind. <laughs> no, not at all. Hey, thank you. Uh, Christel. Christel. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you, Irene, for organizing this and just say how great it is to see many, so many friends and colleagues here today. Uh, Jan, thank you for your excellent paper. I really enjoyed this and it's really great to see some consideration of the framing of Iamblichus's reply and uh, Porphyry's letter to Anibo, uh, which I think is very important. And I really enjoyed uh, listening to you. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, I think the framing in a way has a lot to do with these ideas of um, divine revelation and kind of divinatory or oracular communication. Um, and I really liked what you were saying, um, you know, it was fascinating when you were, for example, citing on the Pythagorean way of life 105, where Iamblichus describes symbols as analogous to the um, prophecies and oracles of the Pythian gods, and they reveal marvellous thoughts and produce divine inspiration um, in those who have grasped their meaning. So then I was very interested in what you were saying about the grounds for the attribution of a authority. And I really like the way that you're showing how the kind of methodology of questioning um, and interrogating um, in a rational sense, um, what is being said in the reply um, is important as well and sits alongside those kinds of ideas of um, divination. And I would say that kind of revelation or divination as involving questioning and reflection and so on comes at least partially from the Greek tradition and the whole idea of you never accept an oracle uncritically, 
And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that in particular. Well, yes, I, I refrained from uh, putting it in that context uh, for this talk, but of course you're right. Huh? Um, many parallels could be um, uh, drawn, I think, with uh, the way um, Plutarch deals with uh, Egyptian myths. Uh, many parallels can be drawn with um, Philo of Alexandria, but you can go back to Plato himself and the, the oracle given to Socrates. Um, uh, so the beginning of philosophy in a way, uh, in, in the way it is being presented, because Socrates needs to find out what it means. Um, and that's of course a very Greek thing to do, I, I would say. I, I don't know much about, um, let's say non-Greek traditions in themselves. Um, but you, you uh, so I, I won't say anything about that, but you can see that in Greek uh, culture, this is, uh, let's say, a predominant uh, concern when dealing with divination, oracles, and so on. Yeah. Um, very much so. So uh, e Iamblichus, mm -hmm. although, um, Stemming well, we, we think either from Syria or maybe Lebanon, because um, we don't really know which Chalkis he came from. There were some doubts about that. But, um, and he belonged to a, 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 a priest class uh, in uh, the family, we know that. Um, but he was a very Hellenized uh, person in, in his formation. So, uh, he, he's imbued uh, in Platonic thought. He knows his Plotinus, he, he, he has read Porphyry, he has uh, dealt with these texts and, and he knows many other texts, of course. Huh? Um, but what, what is interesting is, I, uh, I think, is that they, um, especially someone like he, and, but also someone like Plutarch, he takes these traditions very seriously, trying to, um, call information from them or, or, or insights from them. Information is not a good word, but insights. Yeah? Um, and then comments on how to do that. That, that is something that I find, find so interesting uh, that you could also uh, look at it in a, even in an Aristotelian way. Huh? Uh, so it, it is somewhat um, uh, comparable to how we deal with endoxa. We, we get, information from these traditions, but of course we, we need to work with them. So even Aristotle has something of that. Um, and especially as also if you look at the, the, the uh, uh, exoteric works of Aristotle, so the fragments, but that, that will get me too far. But uh, yeah, certainly it is part of the Hellen Hellenic tradition to, to do exactly this, I think. And um, it has been, cast aside a bit in the study of, of philosophy huh? because of the division of disciplines. They say, well, this is religion. It's not interesting. Uh, we want to do pure uh, demonstrations and so on. Um, and that is certainly uh, a bias that, that we should avoid, I think. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Jan, can I just follow up very briefly? Uh, you yeah, were sure. quoting 1.1 1 .1 where he talks about the different sources of the questions and the various branches of knowledge, including um, the sources that are not worthy of note or alien sources. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about this lately, you know, who's he referring to? What kind of questions is he referring to here? And um, Something I, that I think is very interesting is to look at this use of non-Hellenic traditions alongside, of course, the Hellenic Greek material he's presenting in relation to the idea that, of course, these are all Mediterranean religions or religious traditions at a time when they're particularly under threat from progressive Christianization. And so I think that it may be possible that Iamblichus is referring to any kind of philosophically unsound um, opinion or idea um, in quite a general way, which accords very closely with the methodology that you've been laying out and attributing to him. But I also wonder if he particularly is referring to the Christians there as well. And I just, what in relation to 
the kind of historical dynamics going on at this time. Um, and, you know, is his attempt at gaining authority in this way in order to codify ancient Mediterranean religious traditions? Um, it's just something I've been thinking about, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I have thoughts that go in two directions. I was first thinking of um, Plutarch, who criticizes uh, certain uh, aspects of religion, uh, Greek, uh, Egyptian religion, for instance, the uh, animal worship, yeah? treating animals as gods. Where, uh, and there are some other cases where Plutarch says, well, these elements, for instance, when they attribute to gods certain things that can only be said of demons, like uh, evil uh, character traits and so on. But I'm also thinking of something uh, or another author that is not very well known, but is uh, almost a contemporary of Yamlukis, slightly later, the, um, Alexander of Lycopolis, who wrote an anti manichaean uh, text. Um, but uh, treats Manichaean thinking as a, 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 a subset of Christian th uh, thought. So he and and he he criticizes uh, them for uh, certain views they have on good and evil, especially on matter. Um, and he he it's a bit ambivalent what he says about their relation to the Christians. So uh, and it's what he says about the Christians themselves. So the let's say the more official Christian. Um, uh, mainstream Christian, Christianity, it's also ambivalent what he says about them. So he starts by saying it's a, it's a simple philosophy. Um, and he probably means by that, um, but he means two things, I think. Uh, simple is a praise because it is contrasted with, with, with what the Manichaeans did with it. They made, uh, they made it overly complex uh, and, and, and uh, uh, distorted the, the, the true tradition, but it's also simple because it talks to simple people in, in a simple way. So it's also kind of criticism. Uh, so, but you see, uh, Platon is very close to Iamblichus. Also, um, I would say, um, uh, in terms of where he came from, huh, from Lycopolis in Egypt, um, has this. Uh, this attitude, and, and you could think of Plotinus and the Gnostics, whose relation with Christianity is also complex, to say the least. Huh? Um, so I think, yes, they, they, these may be, so the Hebrews, the, uh, the Christians especially, they will, will, yeah, it's very likely that they are part of, of that, yeah. Although thank I don't you. see a direct trace of it, yeah. But thank you for the suggestion. I, I have to think about it more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Tornese. Well, thank you very much for the lecture and this in very interesting discussion. Um, my question is um, inspired by the idea that Ficino, when when gave the name to this work, uh, cho chose uh, to call it the uh, something about the mysteries and not the, the theology of the Egyptians or the other traditions, because as you were saying that there is some kind of epistemic authority in this mysteric wisdom, which is even more universal than religion or philosophy. So my question is something like there is a difference between religion and mysteric wisdom and also the, the validity of a tradition um, is usually uh, brings disagreement when when it's uh, understood in also in philosophical terms like like saying when it's very common in modern scholarship the the idea that the different from Iamblichus that uh, platonic tradition um, it's not Pythagorean because Pythagoreanism is an invention or like the Platonic tradition and its authority is invented because the, the Pythagoras uh, model is an invention of Platonists. So in this way, um, if this wisdom, which is uh, more universal than philosophical uh, disagreements or religious disagreements, 
it wouldn't be enough to say that if in a text there is a presence of platonic expressions, uh, that doesn't make the text invalid uh, and like an apocryphal text only because the expression of this universal mysteric wisdom has been expressed in, in platonic terms, like hermetic also texts or even uh, Pythagorean text or Orphic text, no? My, so my question is why um, this, uh, in modern scholarship, this idea of um, a mysteric tradition is, is, is so suspected or questioned and why Iamblichus prefers to, to talk about this in, as, in a more universal way and not um, that I, I don't know how to say, like it's, it's uh, above all disagreements. And if that gives authority to this, this text. Sorry, my... I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, if I can answer um, all aspects of your question, especially uh, not, I think, why uh, there is this contemporary distrust of it. I mean, it's just, I, I can, we can, just see that as, as, as an evidence, that there is evidence for that. The reasons for it, so the sociological reasons for that, uh, that's something I will not speculate on. But um, so first mysteries, you know, um, if, all, if you just look at the word theology, you al already have the logos in it. Huh? So mm -hmm. the reason for um, uh, taking mysteries to be more universal is that it's only when they have been explained and and have been made discursive using logoi in a certain cultural context that they become understandable for a specific culture whereas before that as long as as, as they are shrouded in mystery and the symbol symbols have not been explained you could say okay they're open to hermeneutics in different traditions right? and uh and the work that Iamblichus does is to, to, to try to explain how to deal with um, perceived disagreements. So, or perceived differences or incompatibilities between these uh, texts. So you could see that as indeed there is this, let's say, um, these founts of wisdom in different cultures, but that remain close to us, which is also uh, in the word mystery itself. Huh? They remain close to us as long as we haven't uh, done the work of uh, interpretation. And so it's very, in, very important to show what the conditions are for, for that to be possible and the limitations. Uh, so if, he needs to explain, for instance, uh, uh, this was one of these texts that you, uh, you alluded to, huh? why in certain texts there seems, they seem to be Greek philosophy because they contain syllogisms or something that looks like syllogisms, they contain demonstrations. Um, if you can explain that this is already the work from, from people who have done the work of uh, putting it into discursive, um, in a, in a discursive mode, then of course you can at the same time protect, which was a word that is very important for Iamblichus, huh? so protect the, uh, the, these traditions from ridicule or from uh, misunderstandings and explain why what you get from them is valid because of the, let's say the epistemic virtues, the, the experience and so on and so on. So, um, and I would say this is a, a, an attitude that is indeed, um, uh, well, was common in his time or rather common in his time, but is not common nowadays. I, I, I agree with that, yeah. But the reasons for that, I'm not capable of, of, um, of answering, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, I was thinking that the content sometimes looks more important for Iamblichus than the form that is expressed, no? You, you mentioned that too the content yes. of this wisdom, yes. But of course, with the translation, uh, as, as, as he also says, in some cases, if you translate, you cannot preserve the full content. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, so you yeah. make it understandable, but for instance, these names, you should also keep the names because they have something that you cannot put in discursive mm -hmm. mode. So there is also this uh, element, yeah. Yeah, and that's theur theurgic also, no? The, yes. the, the, the way that they affect reality. Yes, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And um, Dennis Clark, please. And we cannot, we cannot hear you. You are unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Could you perhaps write your question on the chat and I can read it out for you? No? Um, I can perhaps ask a small question if you are not too tired, Jan, and see how it goes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, oh, you can perhaps use your, I have a message here saying it is his microphone. So you can perhaps type it and I will read it out. Um, so my small question is on T3. I'm wondering whether you think that false and spurious subversi and gnosis means the same thing and they both point to a doctrinal transmission or whether sevdesi, false sevdi could mean something different and point to doctrinal conflict. So not only, there would be not only a problem of transmission, but there would be some, uh, some uh, treatises which would be uh, considered as authentic, but in a sense of, um, uh, as Pythagorean, but different different uh, tensions within Pythagoreanism. Mm -hmm. Would... Yes, I was thinking that <clears throat> the two um, adjectives do not mean exactly the same thing. And as you said, false uh, is about what they say, so the content. Spurious is about the uh, authorships, uh, the question of uh, who is the presumed author of what is the attribution of authorship that is in the text. Um, but I would say that it's the same text. I, I would also point to the Tekai, which, which links the two closely together. It's <clears throat> probably the, the spurious text, which also contains false uh, statements rather than two different types of text. Because then you would have to explain why you would have authentic texts that could still contain um, obvious falsities. Perhaps, perhaps curious uh, would be uh, written by people who uh, take somebody else's name. Uh, yes. yes. Where, and whereas uh, false uh, would uh, the author would not uh, borrow, let's say, Archaita's name, uh, but what he presents as Pythagorean simply is not uh, what Iamblichus considers as authentic Pythagoreanism. That could be, yes, that could be. So a slight difference. I I would certainly uh, say that that there is a difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what is interesting is that. He is aware of, so, or let's say, a pseudepigraphic text was a known practice, which is clear from this. So people know that it exists. Uh, and still he treats some of these texts as genuine, which also means, of course, that he has done some work on these texts and uh, must have had arguments to, uh, to treat them this or that way. And actually, um, uh, someone who, who, who nowadays works in Leuven, uh, Angela Ulaco, has worked a lot on this. And she, uh, uh, 
she shows uh, how how this is actually done. How, how do how different authors, not just the Amlicus, but also, for instance, uh, Simplicius, uh, argue for uh, these texts and what what their contents are. So, so which is again a proof of the kind of of work that needs to be done in order to deal with the tradition. Yeah. So spurious could still contain true material in a way, not not be false. Yes, I think that that could be true. Yeah, so you could have spurious texts that 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 are well made and that they pre they present truth because they are based on insights that come from somewhere. Yeah, authority. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I think that uh, Dennis Clark uh, has fixed the problem with the microphone. So. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, first off, Jan, thank you very much. It's really nice to be able to talk to you okay. after all these years. Yeah, great to see you. Yeah, and, and hear you. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Um, this is maybe more of a comment. Um, I, I got, it definitely plays off of what Crystal said, which I always, it, I can think of prove this, but it almost seems to me that one thing, and because it's about always in the background is what do we need to do to combat Christianity? And that's a somewhat reductive view. Maybe you could, it's, it's not just that. I think he tries to create this very synthetic, uh, almost scholastic kind of pulling together of much of pagan culture. But I think it's in, you know, also with a, a view of combating Christianity, but he does it in a, you know in a very platonic way, and he's very thorough and he's very uh, comprehensive. So we have to you know we have to accommodate the Pythagoreans, we have to come so forth and so on. But one thing that's uh, it seems to me about and what Professor Trenese was saying is maybe Piccino wasn't really that off because it almost seems to me that and this plays to what you're saying about the uh, the whole theme about authority. It almost seems to me that in a way he's saying, um, yes, there, we have this structure of authority and it's crucial, but it's almost like he's saying to the reader and to Porphyry, um, you need to almost initiate yourself, if you will, by using these disciplines to take on that authority. So it's not just an appeal to authority. It's almost like it seems to me a kind of, we, we'd call it, I guess, a virtual initiation. Because uh, the mysteries, I think, at that time were, they were falling on hard times, weren't they? I mean, and, and by the way, too, it's important to think about all this, this Egyptian knowledge. I mean, um, it wouldn't be too much longer after this was written, or maybe it had already started, that the Roman government stopped funding those priests. And when that happened, along with the really apparently fairly quick rise of Christianity in Egypt, that all this would just evaporate. So he's, I think he's also trying to like do a, maybe that's, he, maybe he didn't see that quite yet, but the handwriting was probably on the wall. Um, so again, he's trying to pull all these things together, but it almost seems to me that, um, it's a special kind of, it, it is a kind of mystery in a way. Mm -hmm. And of course, the injury is very much that way too, isn't it? It's, it's a very personal act where, you you know, that you engage in. You don't necessarily have to go to Eleusis to do it. It's, you know, it's very personalized. But the other thing I wanted to bring, so it's more of a comment there. The other uh, thing I wanted, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm terribly, terribly sorry for interrupting. It is very rude, but uh, we only have a, one minute left. We are running out of time. Oh. I'm afraid it is automatic, and we are going to be. Uh, home. It's okay. So, so perhaps you can continue by email. I, I'm really sorry for interrupting, but we have to thank Jan Opsomer before uh, our time uh, runs out. I, I'm really sorry for the. Oh, for the okay. Could you perhaps? Uh, by write by email and just have one minute to to thank Jan. 
thank you very much for the talk and for the fascinating discussion. And I'm sorry that our time runs out. Uh, if I can say one thing to Dennis, it's a program, I think, and you can see it in what Eunapius writes about the students of Iamblichus who have a very clear political mission. And it's, it's a lot about that, about gaining influence with influential people. And so I think this educational program is part of the same, let's say, general effort. How much Yamlikas himself was already involved in this? Certainly his disciples, his immediate disciples were. You can see that very clearly in, if you read uh, Eunapius. But thank you for the comment, yeah. And indeed, if you write an email to me, I will uh, reply. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Uh, and thank you all for the discussion. And I'm terribly sorry for this, but yes. time has run out. It has been so, uh, so fascinating that we have lost the sense of time. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Jan. Thank you for your attention huh? and the discussion. Yeah. Thank you all. And see you on the 26th of April uh, uh, with Professor Anne Seppard's talk. So okay. thank you again. Thank you. And see you soon. <laughs>